late 80s up until the noughties, um, which is about the time I started in journalism. And there was this sort of legendary woman over there who seemed to have done absolutely brilliant things. She was a, a fellow at All Souls, and she's now a visiting professor at King's College, London. And um, she first spoke to me about writing this book about a couple of years ago. So I'm very pleased to actually see it's reached fruition. However, one of the things I noticed right at the beginning, well, right at the, in fact, right at the end of the book, was the number of uh, references in it. It looks like an academic book. It looks like a history book. And I noticed that, Marianne, are you trying to prove something to, um, <laughs> are you feeling insecure that people might question the, um, the, the weight of your intellect? I was definitely trying to prove something, yes. I mean, partly because this was as a result of spending a year as a visiting fellow at All Souls. And so, you know, I wanted it to be at least academically respectable. But also, you know, I don't know whether any of you guys, my father used to say, come on now, punch me in the stomach. And he would hold his stomach muscles really tight. We were children, we'd go bang and nothing would happen. It was like a sort of brick wall. And that's what I wanted this to be. I wanted it to be <laughs> absolutely, you know, I wanted the evidence to be indestructible really, because I know a lot of people will try to destroy it. And I just thought if there's really compelling evidence here, at least it gives me, you know, a good basis from which to make the argument, yeah. So I think um, one of the most compelling bits, uh, pieces on, in that is actually relatively early in the book, where we talk about two people, Ben Barris and Joan Roughgarden, um, both of you have um, rather interesting experiences from having transitioned from, uh, for Ben, it was from female to male and for Joan the other way around. And they both ended up perceiving the world in a rather different way. Now, I think it, it, they pose a good answer to the question, is there actually an authority gap? Uh, you know, is Marianne just writing a book for the sake of writing a book at this point in time? Exactly. I should, first of all, t tell you what the authority gap is. I'm sure you all guess, but it's, it's the fact that we are just still more reluctant to accord authority to women than to men. We basically take men more seriously than women. We assume they know what they're talking about until they prove otherwise. And for women, it's the other way around. And as a result, women get underestimated, ignored, their views ignored, talked over, interrupted, their expertise is challenged more. Uh, and they're basically undermined or mandermined, as, uh, as I call it. Um, and so I, I thought this, I came across this story of these two Stanford professors who each transitioned in middle age in the opposite direction. They didn't even know each other at the time. It was the Dean who brought them together because she knew they were both going through similar um, experiences. So Ben Barris, when he began living as a man said, he was a, he was a neuroscientist, he was middle aged. And he said, I've had the thought a thousand times, I'm just taken more seriously now. And he said, the same damn work is taken more seriously. And someone was overheard at the back of one of his seminars who didn't know his history saying, oh, Ben Barris gave such a great seminar, but then his work's so much better than his sister's. <laughs> Joan Roughgarden transitioned in the opposite direction. She, when she was living as a man, had been on the university Senate committee. She'd been hugely respected. Her pay was in the top 10% of her cohort. When she became, when she started living as a woman, suddenly her relative pay dropped. She found it much harder to get grants. She lost her seat on the university Senate committee. She said, I couldn't finish a sentence without being interrupted by a man at meetings. And to start with, she said, well, hey, you know, uh, if women are discriminated against, then I'm just gonna, you know, I'm now, I'm, now I'm living as a woman, I'm just jolly well gonna join in. And then she said, well, the novelty and thrill of that has worn off, I can tell you. <laughs> Um, and what I loved about these two stories, and it's not just those two, because there have actually been academic studies of much broader groups of trans people, particularly trans men, and ha they've had exactly the same experience. They're just respected more, they do better in their careers, the trans men and the trans women have the opposite. But what I found so interesting is that this is actually a very scientific way of proving the case that there is this authority gap, because Normally, it's really hard if you're a woman, you know, and you say, oh, they're just being sexist or my male colleague is doing better than me and it's not fair. And people will just say, well, maybe he's better than you. But actually, these, this is exactly the same person with the same ability, intelligence, experience, personality um, and character. And they're being treated differently because the one variable that matters has been isolated. And that's what's changed. 
Yeah, so uh, I want to sort of talk about how we get to the point of you, you have small children who have virtually sort of, you know, no opinion at that point when they're little about the world. And then gradually as they grow up, suddenly this sort of division begins to happen. Um, confidence is one of the things that you pick up on in the book. And you say that basically for, for, from school onwards, from about the age of about five, if you say, well, who's a smart kid? Um, a child will identify either a boy or a girl. From the age of about six or seven, that begins to change, doesn't it? Yeah, so five-year-olds will just choose a member of their own gender. Once they turn six, boys will carry on nominating boys, girls start nominating boys. And, you know, when they're asked to say things like, you know, there's a uh, game for really, really smart children, or there's a game for children who really like working hard, you know, which teammate would you choose? and they choose the boy for the really smart and the girl for the working hard. But also what's even sadder is that when they're asked what sort of game they'd like to take part in at that sort of age, the girls stop saying, I'd like to do the really smart game. I'd like to do the hard working game. And people who have studied school classrooms find th this sort of behavior is encouraged by teachers without them even necessarily noticing it. So, you know, a boy will call out in class, uh, call out an answer in class, and the teacher will ask him what he thinks is the answer. A girl shouts out an answer, and the, and the teacher will say, put your hand up if you want to speak. Boys are called on much more than girls. Uh, they're called out to the front much more than girls. Um, they're basically encouraged by teachers to speak out, and girls are encouraged to stay quiet, be well-behaved, be diligent, sit at the back of the class. And then, of course, this all develops into adulthood. So um, another problem we have is that um, when it comes to confidence, boys, when you look at a group of boys together, they will be very competitive on the whole and they will boast and they will say, you know, my dad's got a better car than you and I can kick the ball further than you. And that's actually how they bond is through competition and boasting and bigging themselves up. But I'm sure you all remember, and even now as female adults, that doesn't go down well in a group of girls, right? So girls say, oh, I'm no good at maths. Oh, I hate my hair. Oh, my bum's too big. And that's actually how they bond is through admitting weakness and vulnerability. And that continues into adult life. And therefore, if you're the sort of really bouncy, confident girl who's really pleased with herself, she's going to be squished by her peer group as well as by parents and teachers. And so this sets us up for adult life. And I was just hunting for the reference for the absolutely brilliant bushfires example in there, and I can't find it. Okay. I'll try and remember it. Okay, so <clears throat> actually, can I talk quickly about confidence in adult life and, and how difficult it is for women? Okay, so we're always being told, just be more confident, just be more assertive, just lean in more. If only you were more confident, you'd get your pay rise, you'll get your promotion. Basically, it's our fault, okay? If only it were that simple. <laughs> because actually what happens is, if you are underconfident and not assertive enough, you don't get the pay rise, you don't get the promotion, people don't even listen to you in meetings, okay? But if you are as confident or as assertive as men, people recoil. They dislike women who are as confident and assertive as men. Now, and, and, and I'm afraid women also dislike women who are that confident quite often. Why is this? Because we have these horrible, sneaky little stereotypes that worm their way into our brains from childhood that say that women should be warm and nurturing and not self-promoting and not competitive and kind and generous. These are what social psychologists call communal characteristics. So we should show communality. Whereas men should be confident and assertive and showing leadership and um, you know, self-promoting. All these things are not just allowed, but expected of men. And these are called agentic characteristics or showing agency. But the trouble is in order to get on in a career as a man or a woman, you have to show agency. You have to be confident and assertive and show leadership and that sort of thing. And, but people see these stereotypes as not just descriptive of what women are like, but prescriptive of what women ought to be like. And therefore when a woman goes against those stereotypes and starts behaving like a man, as it's seen, people really don't like it. And they start using adjectives like abrasive, strident, aggressive, bossy, overbearing, ball-breaking, bitchy even. Ambitious. ambitious. <laughs> now, okay, so A, men are never described as ambitious, but if they are, fine, that's what we expect them to be. I was described as ambitious in a derogatory way all the way through my journalistic career. Uh, all my male colleagues were, obviously. 
Uh, and in fact, I, I quote the New York Times of all newspapers, which is after all liberal newspaper, described one of my interviewees, Elaine Chow, who was then transportation secretary in, in the US, as unapologetically ambitious. <laughs> <laughs> What did she have to apologize for? She was a politician, you know. Um, uh, so anyway, so for women, it's terribly hard to get this confidence thing right because there's such a narrow path between being seen as underconfident and being seen as overconfident. And navigating that path requires such talent and ability. What I've actually discovered is that the only way to get away with it really is to overlay it with ladles of warmth. Okay, so if you're going to be confident and assertive, which you often got to be in life, you have to, as a woman, not as a man, you have to smile a lot, you have to make jokes, you have to, you know, really try hard to get people to like you, or they will dislike you. And the other problem, which it becomes a sort of triple bind for women, is that women tend to be hard and promoted on likability, and men don't. So men will be hard on competence and potential, but women, particularly if men are doing the hiring, are hard a lot on likability and also influence, which is what we're about to get to with bushfires, yeah. is so, it all about likability. So the bushfires example, I, I, when I read it in the book, I went, that's absolutely jaw dropping. So this was again, comp it was about competence. It was about um, faced with the bushfire, there was a competent group person in the group and who had to argue a case and where they fell in the rankings within the group um, showed how a group would react essentially to a very confident woman. Yeah. So uh, pe people were given a little briefing on how to survive a bushfire. And then they had to rank in what they thought was in order of importance, what you would, the things that you would need to have with you to survive a bushfire, whether it's a torch or a fire extinguisher or whatever. Um, and the ones who got the ranking most close to right, according to real experts, were deemed the experts in the group. So each group had one expert. The expert didn't know they were an expert. They didn't know that they'd chosen the right objects. Women performed just as well in this task as men, and they were just as confident about their ability as men. But not only were the women experts not listened to, so in other words, they would make an argument for the things that one ought to um, have on you to, get to survive a bushfire, and the group didn't listen to them. Not only were they not listened to, but they were listened to even less than the female non-experts. So you think, how can this, but whereas male experts, of course, did influence the group much more than male non-experts. So how can this be? Well, the reason was, A, everybody had low expectations that women would actually know about this and would, you know, would know what they were talking about, even though they were just as good as the men. And women as well had low expectations of other women, I'm sorry to say. But secondly, experts often have to challenge a group because they will say, no, actually, I really do think a torch ought to be in the top three or whatever. And people don't like women challenging. So they're happy for men to challenge, but they get really uncomfortable when women challenge. The other thing, which is <clears throat> something I notice a lot on Twitter, in fact, why I barely ever tweet now, is um, essentially it becomes a kind of male backslapping club where somebody writes an article of mail and all the other men go around going, isn't that the most marvellous article ever? And in, in the background, <laughs> the, women, <clears throat> the women are texting each other going, it's OK, it wasn't actually that brilliant. Um, but, you know, you can see that you can, this is, you've actually found that statistics for this, where you've seen the number of men who will follow other men will not accord their, and then will not accord the same authority to the very few women that they do indeed follow. And as a result, you know, women's voices just continue to diminish within that kind of written sphere. The same thing happens with book reviews as well, where the reviewers are predominantly male, predominantly reviewing books written by men. Yeah, you're right. So um, I'm going, I'll talk about Twitter first and then books, but both are important, I think. So, and particularly for journalists, actually, you're probably, no, sorry, we're journalists. <laughs> probably not all of you. Um, but Twitter is very important for journalism because it gets your voice out there. And a study was done of the 2017 general election. Who were the 10 most influential political journalists on Twitter? Now, given that Laura Koonsberg was then BBC political editor and therefore the most senior political journalist on Twitter, how many women do you think made it into the top 10? Hmm. Big fat zero, not even Laura Koonsberg. So everyone was aghast about this and, and you know, how can this be? Is this really? So they decided that the, the data scientists who discovered this decided to do a deeper dive. And they discovered that what was happening was that men weren't following women in the fact the female political journalists in the first place. So not even letting them into their newsfeed. And even if they did let them into their newsfeed, 
they weren't retweeting them and they weren't commenting on them nearly as much as they were on the male political journalists by a factor of about five. I mean, really huge. Um, and this is the same in the US where women actually make up pretty much half of all Beltway you know, political journalists. But the male political journalists were retweeting each other about 90% of the time. So it's not just that they're not according us authority for what we were, they're not even listening to what we say in the first place <laughs> before they even judge whether it's worth according authority. And it's pretty much the same with books. So I've actually commissioned some research for this book, which shows that women on average will read books by men and by women 50% of the time. We read about half and half books by men and by women. Men on average will read 80-20. So they're four times more likely to read a book by, uh, by man than a book by a woman. So again, it's not just that they're not saying, oh, this book has no authority. They're not even reading it in the first place. So if we can't get our views across to them, how can we get anywhere at all? Uh, you'll also notice, sorry, just very briefly, if you have a look at um, books, uh, you know, summer books or books of the year, who is doing the recommending and who are they recommending? And it's actually got, it's got quite a bit better in the last year or two. Mainly, I think there's been a fuss made about it. But on average, you get two or three times as many men doing the recommendations. And they're always recommending books by blokes. So it's blokes recommending books by blokes, <laughs> sometimes to other blokes, uh, whereas women will be much more even handed in their recommendations. So there's a lovely phrase you use in the book, which is compound, in which is comparing this to compound interest, which is just a continual um, increase of all these slights added up and up and up and up. It means that eventually you get to the point where a woman who may have started exactly the same point as man cannot get to that same level, um, which I think is a sort of fascinating way of just going back over the problem saying, because there is no one particular detail that flips it it's so many tiny things there are also some other wonderful I mean the the, the book is not a winterthon about men at all but the details in it uh, are so beautifully put so there's, there's a conversation about appearance and how there's a lot of focus on appearance there's a great piece on voice and how we talk too much um and you know women talk 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 what actually happens in meetings okay. <laughs> so on average women and men talk the same number of words a day Okay, so if you wire people up and um, record their conversations during the course of the day, it's pretty much the same. So we are not chatterboxes, um, contrary to the stereotype. But in public meetings, and when I say public meetings, I just mean, you know, any meeting at work or whatever, in any sort of public sphere, men talk so much more than women. And I call this conversational man spreading. They just take up so much space in the meeting. Now, in some ways, this isn't surprising, because if you look at all the authority gap behavior that I'm complaining about, the fact that women don't get listened to as much in meetings, they get interrupted much more, they get talked over, um, they get their views challenged much more than men. It's not surprising they think, well, is there really much point <laughs> in talking? Um, but it's also to do with confidence. And what happens is that if women, women have to make up 80% of a room for women to, to talk a proportionate amount of time, I, if there are five people, four of them are women, women will actually talk for a fifth of the time. If a man is in a small minority in a room, he'll still talk more than his proportionate amount. Um, but the other thing, interestingly, that makes a difference is if you change the rules of the meeting so that instead of a sort of majority vote or a, you know, a sort of attempt at consensus reaching a decision, a conclusion, if instead you make the rule unanimity, like in a jury, so everyone has to agree, women will, will speak up. And that's because they realize that their voice has to be heard because everyone around that table has to agree. So I, that really does suggest that the women, the reason women don't speak up as much is because they realize that actually they're just not going to influence the meeting. Um, the other very interesting thing on voice was on the hertz, on the kind of basically the wavelength of, the, uh, of women's voices um, and how high or low they were to gain authority. Now, Thatcher is well known to have taken voice training lessons and she got you gave me the number there as well in the book. It was so authoritative. You told me she dropped it by 60 hertz. Um, but you also began to find a correlation between societies where women had lower voices and therefore more authority and those with higher voices where culture had sort of still deemed them a sort of old fashioned idea of a woman. Yeah, I found this fascinating. So the average pitch of a woman's voice has dropped quite a lot over the past few decades in more gender equal countries. But the more gender equal a country is, 
the lower the average pitch of a woman's voice. But in very unequal countries like Japan, women still talk with these really high voices. I mean, but it's a really dramatic difference. Um, and, and Japanese women use a pitch that no British woman would ever use, really. Um, and but they're, they're, I mean, it's a very logical thing that we all know that a lower voice connotes more authority. Now, I don't know to what extent, because it's impossible to disentangle, this is because we associate male with authority. And of course, men have lower voices than women. But even within each gender, you know, women with lower voices will sound more authoritative. You know, the women who have perhaps slightly high childish voices, it may be because we associate it with being childish and men can't sound childish because their voices break. But men with quite high voices, also, we don't find so authoritative, do we? You know, Chris Eubank we, or David Beckham, we sort of laugh at a bit. <laughs> Whereas, you know, sort of Jon Snow, you know, sounds like he knows what he's talking about. I'm not sure I could, if, if it really is 450 hertz, I think it might be, on, be, on, be beyond my hearing range these days. Um, the other thing we um, need to talk about, actually, is, is when you have layered minorities so intersectionality so um a number of these cases will apply double and triple so so particularly if you're, uh, if you're a person of color uh particularly if you've got a disability so if you think you're being slightly invisible as a white woman um just wait and see what happens next yeah i'm, I'm, I'm afraid to say you know we talk about compound interest it really does compound the problem um, if you are a woman of color particularly if you're a disabled woman that seems to be the worst of all um, but you know, women of color actually. What the, one of the interesting things about it, so so they're much more likely to say you know that they have to prove their competence more, that they um, don't feel their their talents are appreciated at work. You know, all the sort of measurements that we try to use to to measure this gap um, are all much worse for women of color. Uh, and class, of course, makes a difference. Accents in this country, in particular, um, it's much easier if you've got my sort of voice, frankly. Um, that's also true of men, of course. Uh, but you know, I could have written this book about race or about class. It's just, it's the, the, the same sort of problems. Um, but being a woman, I've written it about being a woman. Um, but there are some interesting wrinkles. So, for instance, there are racial stereotypes which get overlaid on gender stereotypes. So, actually, black women have less of a problem with being confident and assertive than white women do. Because we, because of the stereotypes, we tend to expect black women to be more confident and assertive, sassy or whatever. And they can actually get away with that without people uh, recoiling and, fight and feeling uncomfortable uh, more easily than white women can. And also actually lesbians uh, are sort of halfway up the pecking order between women and perhaps gay men before straight men, but um, they are expected, again, to be more confident, more assertive, more traditionally masculine. And therefore they can quite often get away with behavior that straight women can't. The, um... So it's sort of the, the big question is, why does this all come about? And um, obviously, as women are not a singularity, neither are men, there are a whole range of men. Um, but there is, a, as you get to sort of the end of the book, you begin to try and talk about various theories that could explain some of the kind of more aggressive aspects of male behavior, which still remains fascinating because to, to us, because we're sitting there thinking, what have we actually done wrong when this sort of, just not the microaggressions and the macroaggressions come our way? Yeah. So when it comes to the microaggressions and that you get from a lot of men and, and, and even men who think that they're really liberal, okay, um, that is just a question of the world we see around us, which basically has guys in charge. And therefore that creates this heuristic in our brain, this sort of automatic association between men and authority and women and sort of submission or subservience. Um, and so, and that is also what we've been brought up with. A lot of us, we've seen perhaps our father working more than our mother, our father earning more money than our mother. And so that just sort of creates this template in our brain, which we have to work terribly hard against. But the macroaggressions are another matter altogether. So I wrote a, a chapter on the really vile things that happen to women who dare to voice an opinion. So this is from a very small minority of men. This is not your average man. This is, a, I have to say, a very small minority, but of really vicious, horrible, vile men who troll people. So, of course, as a woman in public life, you expect to be trolled. And, you know, you shouldn't have to, but you are. We're 24 times more likely to be abused online than men are, just in general, not just women in public life. 
Um, but you know, if you're a woman who has an opinion in public life, boy, you're going to get punished for it, and you just have to, you know, swallow hard or not look or go off Twitter or something like that. But you know, even teenage girls who put up a YouTube video on how to braid your hair will get rape threats in the comments section. I mean, it's just so, I was so distressed writing this chapter. It was so horrible. Um, so I talked to three or four male psychotherapists about this. Um, I thought I'd talk to men rather than women because they'd have a better insight uh, into the male psyche. Uh, and they all agreed it's all to do with what they call insecure masculinity. And it's to do with what little boys being utterly dependent on their mothers, as little girls are, of course, utterly dependent, but unlike girls who can carry on modeling themselves on their mothers throughout their life and throughout, at least as they grow up, boys have to detach themselves from their mother to whom they're so close and try and identify with their father, who is often actually rather more distant, uh, either both physically or possibly emotionally too. And this is a real wrench for some men. I mean, lots of men manage it absolutely fine, but for some boys and men, it becomes a real wrench and they hate their mother for it. The fact that they are so vulnerable and dependent on her and yet that they are not the, somehow the same person, which is what little babies think that they are. Um, and this creates a sort of sense of entitlement from women combined with a sort of hatred from women. Um, sometimes it's men who as boys were over cosseted by their mothers and sisters and therefore demand the same in adult life and then get very angry when women aren't prepared to behave like that or sometimes it's from boys and men who felt that they ought to have had that and didn't and therefore resent all women for for their childhood but what i also found really disturbing was how much re real misogyny there is amongst teenage boys some teenage boys at the moment and, you know, a lot of us had thought, you know, oh, this is just a generational problem and it'll all just come out in the wash as this generation's young people grow up and there won't be a problem in 20 years time. No. And what's happening is that a lot of very extreme misogynists are starting to groom teenage boys through gaming, YouTube videos, lots of, you know, really innocent, uh, one would have thought, websites. And you now get a lot of teenage boys in school automatically saying girls are feminazis as soon as they start complaining about anything, um, telling them they ought to know their place, don't they realize men are better than women? These are 14 year old boys. This, this is um, the cult of Jordan Peterson though, which is a, a, a series of men actually needing to find a sort of definition and set of rules which have been somewhat taken away from them by being told that actually you've got to be equal having said that there is a new set of rules at the end of this book which we're going to come on to shortly um the the the, the men who made the following comments are not necessarily part of this kind of hardcore group but they it's a little bit it's from an earlier chapter um and marianne picks up a point um picks up um, some research from um alice Wu of berkeley university who's gone through um a website called economic job rumors um, and she says, digital equivalent of the water cooler, where young economists gossip about candidates and vacancies. The 30 words used most often by women uh, about women are hotter, lesbian, BB, standing for baby, sexism, tits, anal marrying, feminazi, slot, slut, hot, vagina, boobs, pregnant, blah, 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 blah. Um, female academic economists. Yep. And in return, <laughs> Um, the uh, the women in return say uh, juice, no, sorry, the ones that are used about men are mainly to do with economics. There are words such as juicy and bully, but also advisor, Austrian after the school of thought, a mathematician, pricing textbook. Um, so that is the difference of language when you don't necessarily name the person speaking, um, which I, I find quite troubling because... <laughs> Okay, so, so this is American Academia, and it's an academic, it's a website used by academic economists, and it's about, you know, economy, academic jobs. Yeah, what can I say? <laughs> so these are other economists, male economists using these terms about female economists. <laughs> God, yes. Yeah, more, if anything. Yeah. I suppose this is the backlash, but yeah, yeah. So, um, sorry to leave you on that sort of dark note, but we're not going to we're not going to from there. The actual, as I said, the book is actually quite positive, and it, there is an idea that, in fact, um, 
there is a benefit to for both sides working together that in fact it actually isn't a zero sum game and that if you develop a more equal society um, in terms of parenting in terms of the workplace um, there are all sorts of unusual benefits that can actually accrue to men yeah so I was very keen to, to have it. In fact, I brought the chapter, it was at the end of the book, and I thought, well, what if men fail to finish this? So I brought it up to about chapter four, I think, <laughs> to say this isn't a zero sum, guys, this is not a zero sum game. You can actually benefit from treating women with more respect and according them equality, you will be better off as a result. And most people, I imagine most men think it's like a seesaw and if we come up, they'll go down, right? And there may occasionally, if we achieve more equality, be occasions when a man doesn't get a job that a woman is equally qualified for and she gets it, right? Though if she's equally qualified, why shouldn't she get it? <laughs> um, but what I say to these men is that in every aspect of your life, you will actually be happier if you treat women with more respect. So why is this? Okay, well, first of all, you all know that when you meet a man for the first time, within two minutes you have clocked whether he's a sexist or whether he's treating you equally. And frankly, sexism is not a good look for a guy, right? <laughs> You're not gonna want to be his friend or his colleague or his lover or his partner if he's patronizing you or not listening to what you're saying. So that's for a start. But actually what the research evidence shows is that both in, um, that in more gender equal countries and also in more gender equal US states, that's what they studied. So the Northern ones, I think, um, men tend to be, uh, they have much greater life satisfaction. They are half as likely to be depressed. They are less, they, they drink less, they smoke less. They have better relationships, both with their partners and with their children. And in more gender equal relationships where the man and the woman, and this is in a straight relationship anyway, um, share the chores and the childcare more or less equally, not only are the women happier and healthier, and more satisfied with their life, which you would expect, and the children are happier and healthier and do better at school and have fewer behavioral problems, but the men are happier and healthier and they sleep better. And this is a complete clincher, they get more frequent and better sex. So <laughs> frankly, QED, what's not to like here? Eh? <laughs> You're trying to persuade the man in your life. <laughs> I think that should be um, on the cover of the book actually. <laughs> Um, how to get better sex, the authority, yeah, uh, bri bridge the authority gap. Um, we, we did first speak about this book about two years ago. Um, and uh, you mentioned to me something that you, you mentioned to me that you wanted to have your name printed on it as um, M.A. Seagart at the time, in order that it wouldn't be defined as a book written by a woman, though we all know who you are, but um, perhaps some people don't. Um, that hasn't happened. You've ended up being Marianne Seagart. You're trying to put a book into the hands of men um, despite promising them better sex in chapter four, also <laughs> having to confront quite a few kind of, you know, systemic issues in society. Um, how do you think you're going to persuade them to actually pick up the book? Oh, I so badly want men to read this book. Otherwise I'm preaching to the choir. You know, everyone in this room knows what I'm talking about, right? But the men don't because I use the analogy, it's as if men are swimming in a river with the current behind them and they're watching the banks go really fast past them and they think, God, I'm a good swimmer. And then they see women coming in the other direction, struggling to make headway against the current. And they think, oh, bless them, they're not as good as we are. <laughs> so, you know, men really need to read this book. Um, well, I really fought hard with my publisher. I so wanted to call myself M.A. Seacart as a sort of in-joke. And because I write a whole chapter about how men don't read books by women, I thought it'd be a nice meta joke. And my friends call me M.A. anyway. Um, but I had a long argument and they said, oh, but you know, everyone who's read you in the Times over the years knows you as Marianne and you know, you will lose readers because it, as if there are that many MAC cards in the world. <laughs> um, but I did fight really hard to, and I, we even changed cover designers because I was so determined, you might want to hold it up, to have a design that was very striking, very confident, but most important, a cover that a, a man wouldn't feel ashamed being seen reading on the tube was, was how I saw it. And I didn't want to have the word women in the title because I thought that would put them off. Um, and I wanted to have as many endorsement quotes from men as from women on the front and on the back. And again, I had to fight because Penguin Random House said, oh, but we know that the sort of people who buy this book will mainly be 25 to 40 year old women, women of professional life. Whatever. And I said, no, I want men to read this book. So yeah, I had to fight.
No, no, a woman. But they just know what the market's like, tragically. No, it's not pinky at all. Actually, this may be the lighting. It's actually a very sort of orangey red. It's, it's almost looks bright red. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think I think basically that the, the principle is buy uh, one copy for yourself and one copy for your uh, the nearest person who sits uh, who you sit next to in the office. Um, now, listen. Um, we've got there will be lots of questions we're going to have a kind of short break now which will be about 10 minutes or so and then we'll come back for um questions observations thoughts um don't drink too much in the interval um <laughs> and i'll do and i'll see you shortly between Zoom and real life and the microphone, isn't it? Yeah, it's supposed to. Can't quite have the stage. Do you want to have a drink? Uh, so, sorry, I've been saving it. Saving um, it for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Very good interview. Yes, very good. Yes. I wrote a couple of questions. I got you here as a constructive question.
Um, hello, everybody. Um, welcome back. Um, fully charged glasses. Um, just before we launch into questions um, with Marianne, um, I wondered whether a couple of you might like to come up on stage just for kind of a bit of group therapy. Um, because I think just listening to this, I think there's, everybody's got some sort of embedded experience of this kind of moment of just obscene sexism and just feels like, feels like they need to get it off their chest. And actually the first person I'd like to ask is Alice, our photographer. Would you, would you just come down very quickly? Um, so I am a photographer, I used to work for Troy at the Evening Standard, London's Diary. Um, and I would do odd jobs for um, another magazine called uh, Interview, who would send me to London Fashion Week. And it was very low pay, so, well, zero pay. But, um, <laughs> but um, so I didn't take a lot of stuff. I needed to go to many shows at, um, on a day. And the men, male photographers, predominantly, all big guys, mostly Italian, would, um, would set up at the top of the catwalk. And I'd, I'd put my masking tape down in a cross saying, Interview Magazine. And then I'd go off and photograph backstage and I'd come back and there was this guy who's just put his huge tripod there and would I'd go, sorry, that, that, that's me. And he goes, oh no, you need, you, I've just got all this stuff. You can probably crouch, crouch under there. <laughs> can't you? Surely you've just got a small camera and it just, you know, it's so nice for you. You can photograph all these great dresses and all this lovely, this lovely fashion environment. No, I'm doing the same job as you are. It's not fair just because I'm yeah, a young girl. It's not very fair. Thank you, Alice. Who's next? <laughs> Come on up. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know your name. Alison. Welcome, Alison. Oh, okay. Um, oh, this is going to be on. Okay. <laughs> Well, um, I won't name any names. Uh, so I work in uh, PR in book publishing, which is predominantly women 
who are the publicists. And as you probably know, a lot of most literary editors are, are men. And so there's already like quite a weird dynamic there. But I have um, a boss who works in editorial who is a man. And I'm very regularly um, told, sported emails by my boss to me from authors who I'm working with about campaigns, about publicity, or literary editors who are asking to meet with him rather than me. And it's hard to think, like, it's hard to know if it's just, oh, I'm just overthinking this, or you do, or you're just actually being undermined and not being taken seriously. And it really just, it's, it's, um, yeah, sometimes it can be really frustrating. <laughs> like I've had, I've had a producer email my boss about an author for publicity. I had emailed that producer two months earlier about the exact same book. So I just, I'm like, oh my God, you can't win. <laughs> Thank you. The yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you need to keep the relationship yeah. with people. Yeah. So you can't just like flash out at you really want to. Oh, <laughs> Alison, I feel your pain. There's a, a, a there's an example I cite in the book um, of a man and a woman who were colleagues and a bit like you, they were sort of dealing with clients. And she always complained that the clients were so hard to deal with. And he said, why? You know, no, they're not. You just take too long to do your job. And one day by mistake, he logged on. He sent an email from her account by mistake and got exactly the same treatment. And so just out of interest, he decided to be her for two weeks. They swapped for two weeks. And he was just astonished by how tricky these clients were, disrespected everything he said, undermined him, challenged, whereas she had a fantastic fortnight. <laughs> <laughs> right. If, if, is there anybody else who just needs to, yes, come up. And then after this, we're going to go into questions. If you're online, please type your questions into uh, whatever special box there is on your screen. Um, so I'm an academic um, at Cambridge University and I've noticed on dating apps uh, men behave quite weirdly about what I do for a living so um, I don't say I have a PhD on my profile but um, I just say that I'm an academic and then often when they when men find out that I have a PhD the reactions are astonishing um, I once had someone ask me to prove that my PhD was real <laughs> um, and I, you know, I had the certificate like on my bookshelf. I was like, I'm not going to actually <laughs> photograph this. Um, and apart from that, which admittedly was quite an extreme reaction, I've had a lot of men just uh, get quite angry at it uh, or even tell me it's not on a worthwhile subject because I'm a philosopher, so it's in philosophy. Um, Cause it's not a STEM subject, it's not math or science. So it's not really a, you know, a proper area. Um, yeah, so that's just my experience of dating being an academic, well, a female academic. And I'm Daisy, yeah. <laughs> you have my page. I must talk to you after. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, on the same subject as an, sorry. <laughs> on the same subject as a philosophy undergraduate at Cambridge, I asked to borrow a, uh, a biography of Wittgenstein from a male student and he said oh I think that's more of a boy's book <laughs> <laughs> okay um, I think we could probably go on all night so I think we're going to move on to questions now um Francesco have you got a question if you just shout it at me I'm going to repeat it so keep it quite short because my brain is a bit addled these days <laughs> Actually, Francesca, why don't you just have the microphone? Because if I've got to repeat all this to the online audience, it's a bit, it's a bit of a farce. Come up here, come up here. We're all friends. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm self-employed and um, I've always thought to myself that I would only ever be self-employed because I couldn't imagine trying to struggle through a corporate hierarchy um, as, a, as, a kind of, as a woman who, who spoke their mind and was quite... Um, I don't know, pugnacious. Um, and I just thought everyone would hate me. So if I'm my own boss, then I don't have to deal with all of that. But recently I 
and this is some, a room full of women, you can all hate me now. Um, I'm quite good at my job. Um, <laughs> um, and I'm regularly instructed to appear in cases where all the other lawyers involved are men and older men um, and quite a lot more senior than I am. And I find this both um, great and also infuriating. Um, and recently, and this is my question, um, I was doing an online hearing. So all the courts have closed to in-person hearings recently for obvious reasons. And I was doing an in uh, uh, online hearing. The judge was on Zoom, it's like Zoom, okay? Um, and I got kicked off by some technological annoyance. So I get thrown out of the chat room um, and I try to log back in, but I have to be allowed back in. And the judge is a part-time judge, so he can't work out how to do it. Um, and I'm sitting there and all I can see, I don't know if you've had this, is I can see the other people in the room and I can see who's talking. So I can't hear them talking and I can't see them, but I can see that the, the, the conversation is continuing and the judge is speaking and then my instructing solicitor is speaking and then opposing counsel is speaking and these are all men in their 50s. Um, and I'm not being allowed back in to the room, but I can see that they are continuing to speak. And I was like shouting at my screen at this point, like not words that I would wish the judge to hear. Although actually at this point, I don't think I would care that much. Um, and they did not let me, it wasn't that they did not let me back in, but for some reason I was not allowed back in. And the decision was taken to adjourn the hearing, which means that it doesn't go ahead. It gets relisted for another time. And my instructing solicitor just, just handled it himself. So he was like, oh yeah, you know, there's not enough time to deal with this. Um, we're going to, I'm going to agree to adjourn it. But he didn't consult me, the barrister that he's paying to represent his client. How do I deal with this? Because I spoke, so I spoke to some of my other female colleagues and they all said, um, you know, you should write to your solicitor and say it's unacceptable. Um, you shouldn't have not been allowed back in. Um, you shouldn't have done the job for me. But I'm like, oh, but I don't want to annoy him or upset him. I don't want to be like, oh, you know, um, you shouldn't have gone ahead without me. Anyway, what do I do? Ooh, I mean, <laughs> usually my advice is to stand up for yourself um, with as much warmth as you can muster in the circumstances, <laughs> just because that helps. Um, so, you know, if you were to say, look, you know, I, I know, you know, it wasn't your fault. It was the judge who couldn't cope with the technology. But, you know, actually, you know, when you think about it, it was actually pretty difficult for me seeing that you were speaking and agreeing to this without being with, without me being consulted. And, you know, just legally, I needed to be in that room. Yeah. Um, I think that's all you can do. Is... I think what I'm going to do is ahead of the next hearing, mm. add to my email and say, should this happen again? Yes. That's a good idea. Um, you know, please do ensure that I am let back in if I get kicked off. Yeah, yeah, good idea. Okay. We've got a short question from Sarah Hornby that I'm going to repeat back. Inspired, inspired by Francesca's question, can you comment on the Jackie Weaver effect? <laughs> I paid her to do promo for my book. <laughs> I mean, wasn't that fabulous, really? I mean, just summed everything up. You don't have to read 350 pages, frankly, except didn't she do well? Yeah. But the great thing was, on Zoom, I mean, Zoom is actually, I, I, I'm sorry about your experience, Francesca, but in some respects, Zoom has been really good for women. because So she was able just to expel these men <laughs> from the meeting, which was great. And you can mute people. And also, it's much harder for men to interrupt and talk over a woman on Zoom. Because interrupting on Zoom, just everything just goes wrong, doesn't it, right? So you sort of have to wait your turn. And you have to put your hand up to speak, your little yellow hand. Um, so actually, it, I, I think Zoom has made meetings easier for women, but of course it won't last. <laughs> yes! <yeah. laughs> That's a really good point. Yeah. She just said that everybody is the same size on Zoom, so you don't get overpowered by men. And right, we've got a question from the audience, which Ellie is going to read out. Okay, so Liz asked, love the talk, thank you. I'm fascinated by your anecdote there about your name and fighting hard against your publisher, but going against what you wanted. Do you think a man would have done the same? Do we back down, interestingly, against other, wi other women? 
in your case, I think you said too easily because we feel we have less authority or is conversely confident to back down because you're actually being strong enough to accept someone else's POV. <laughs> Would a man see this as losing, but we maybe see it as sensible? I'm, spy I'm saying this as a female writer who has also had arguments with her publisher, by the way, so I know the frustration. It just seems so perfectly relevant to the subject matter here. So wanted to ask your views on it. Smiley face, smiley face for warmth. Ha <laughs> ha. That is such a good question. Normally, I don't back down, I have to say. I'm probably the sort of confident, assertive women who people hate for being too masculine. Um, uh, I know, but I know, but that is the that is the world we live in. Um, but I had already been sh so adamant about the cover because I was so unhappy with this. I mean, I had about 10 iterations of this cover. And eventually I, and my male agents who backed me up said, this designer just doesn't get her book and it's just not working. And so Transworld agreed to start all over again with a new cover designer. And even then I, I asked her to come up with, with stronger, you know, brighter, more striking, more perhaps masculine colors. Um, so I had been very stroppy all the way through and I felt that they had given in a lot. And that was probably the only reason in the end I gave in. Also, my agent agreed with her. And on the whole, he's, he's been very supportive of my point of view. But he said, look, you've got this sort of following such as it is as Marianne Seacart. And it seems silly to sort of throw it away. So I did give in. I, mean, I disagree. I think there would be various columns about the fact you changed your name. So in fact, it would get more publicity. Right, um, another question from within the room or from online. Liz says thank you for the lovely answer. Um, I'm very close to pitching a book, and I, um, which is actually about this past year I've had living um, and working in the woods, which is a very kind of masculine, uh, uh, you know, there's loads of guys with chainsaws everywhere. And having discussed it with agents previously, they've always thought, could you write this sort of lovely thing about living in the woods? And I thought, if like, the minute I pitch it as a woman, they'll say no. So I've got, I've already got a pseudonym that I use when I'm up there, when I have to deal with forestry agents and forestry contractors and guys like that, because there's literally no way you can speak to Joy Ladico with a silly name without me being treated as a kind of posh Londoner who doesn't know what's going on. Um, so it'd be very interesting to see what that is going to be quite an interesting experiment if I pitch it under both names. Yeah. Well, I was, yeah, really interesting because you, you, you've read the book and I give the example of this Boston writer called Catherine Nichols who writes her first novel and she, you know, lets lots of her novelist friends read it and they give her, you know, constructive criticism and eventually they say it's really good to go, it's great, send it out to some agents. So she sent it out to 50 agents. Uh, the first, in other words, the first a synopsis and the first three chapters. And was really excited and waited for replies and waited and waited and waited. And finally, she only got two even vaguely positive replies. And they weren't saying, yes, I'll represent you. They were just saying, you know, let's see more of the manuscript. So she conceived what she called her nutty plan. And you've already guessed what it is. <laughs> She sent exactly the same material out to 50 agents under a male name. And before she had even sent the second, she got a reply back from the first saying, very excited, please send this to me. On the first day, she got six replies. She ended up getting 17 positive replies, which she joked made her an eight and a half times better writer as George than as Catherine. Yeah. Um, it would be unfair to say that the world now is the same as the world 30 years ago. Yeah. 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 No, uh, I, uh, this isn't actually one long whinge. It is a lot better than it was. But what worries me is that so many men think the problem has been solved. And I can't tell you the number of men to whom I have uh, posited the idea of this book. And they have said to me rather grandly, oh, but it's all out of date now. Uh, you know, women, women are getting all the top jobs. If anything, the problem's with men. <laughs> I had that former editor of mine at the Times told me that. And uh, he said, I, I sit on all these appointment boards these days and we only ever give jobs to women. Men haven't got a chance of getting on a board these days. As it happened, the very next day, I had a, an email, which I get every month for how many men and women have been appointed to boards the previous month. 19 women, 20 men. It was exactly half and half. So I sent it to him. Question from the front. Thank you. Uh, oh, oh gosh, all right. 
Um, there's a, a very interesting bit of the book in which you talk about how much men perceive women to be talking versus how much they actually talk. And I wondered if you could elaborate on that. Yes, yeah, so this is interesting. So if women talk for 30% of the time, they are perceived not just by men, but by women too, to have dominated the conversation. Uh, and uh, another experiment was done between two men, two women, and a man and a woman. And it was a scripted conversation in which they had um, exactly equal quantities of time. And people were able to perceive it accurately when it was between two men and when it was between two women. But when it was between a man and a woman, they thought the woman had dominated the conversation. So actually women are being quite rational in not speaking as much as men because the other wrinkle to this is that when women are perceived to be talking too much, they're also perceived to be less competent and less likable. So this was done with a fictional CEO and he was either called John or she was called Jennifer. And the description was, this is someone who talks more than, than other people. And for a man, they thought, yeah, great. He's a CEO, of course he does. And that was fine. But if it was a woman, she was perceived to be less competent. How much of it is caused by, we're all working in what are male establishment roles because all of the businesses, they still work in the same way that they, as they were set up 100, 200 years ago, capitalist businesses or whatever. And they've never, they haven't changed for women. Women would not sit in big, boring meetings, letting everyone have their <laughs> 10 minutes of conversation and respecting each other. They, they just work differently. We do work differently. So how much of it is that, that we're actually working in the wrong environments a lot of the time? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's a really good point. We are having to play by men's rules because men run things on the whole. Um, yeah, I think it's very much that. And I think if you, you, know, you find in very female environments, I mean, uh, who was it who works in publishing? I don't know whether it's, yeah, I don't know whether it's different in publishing, which is predominantly female, not at the top, of course. <laughs> but I mean, I, I certainly know that when I've been in meetings of just women, it feels much more collaborative. We affirm each other much more. We're much more likely to say, oh, that's a really good point. And I mean it. Uh, if you're, and, and, and actually studies show that men will affirm other men at meetings but they won't affirm women. And so women are much less likely to be affirmed at meetings. So if you're actually at a meeting and another woman makes a point, really take care to, to, to speak out and say, that's a really good point she made, because that helps. Um, can I just, I'm just gonna do a question from online. Um, this question from online, this is from Siobhan Morin, who says, who says the physicality and voice hurts issue you've been discussing is so interesting and spot on in her experience, but so hard to address. Who do you think are some good examples of women who successfully portray, portray authority without the physicality or lower pitch voice that usually goes hand in hand with being taken seriously? Do you think they are using any particular techniques to do this? Oh gosh, that's put me on the spot. Jacinda Ardern, maybe. I can't think how low her voice is. How low is her voice? Well, she's smiling in pictures because she's conveying warmth in order to mitigate the hostility to her authority. Um, but she, Greta Thunberg, yeah, but look how men hate Greta Thunberg. She, yes, Jacinda Ardern, I was just talking about, yeah, she does it very well. Angela Merkel does it very well, but she does have quite a low voice. Um, Greta Thunberg, uh, I think a lot of men really dislike Greta Thunberg. Because, and, and, and part of the reason is, how dare this child, female child, tell me what to do? Yeah, 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 exactly. She is good, I agree. and Christine Lagarde is fantastic, but I don't think either of them have high voices, but they do really convey authority, I think, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Having been a journalist and then gone into the private sector doing internet content before most people did, I then ended up in the civil service. So though I'm a contractor, I'm still in the civil service. And what is extraordinary there is that actually many of the things you've said do not apply. There is an enormous amount of female authority in the civil service and women are taken very seriously. And if anybody attempts to override a woman they would be absolutely slapped down so you know the public sector has been a tremendous uh, I mean you know it's full of shit as well but um 
it's been a tremendous forerunner in encouraging women to have authority and be in charge and it still is and it's been quite a shock I have to tell you <laughs> so just just it's not so much question, but I don't know if you spoke to women in the in the civil service and you understood any of that no uh, but I'm really encouraged to hear that I do know that you know one of the reasons that women are less well paid than men is that they tend to work more in the public sector than men do. And the reason they work more in the public sector than men do is because there is a better climate for them in the public sector, because there are these policies, you know, and, they, and people have to abide by the policies. And, uh, and it's fantastic news because what it proves is that things can change. Exactly. Yeah. And so. It has been different for 50 years. Yeah. The, the original maternity leave and all those sort of things were constructed because these women were so valuable that they simply could not shed them due to the fact they were having a baby. Yeah, but it was only about 50 years ago that they stopped the marriage bar in the foreign office, which meant that women actually were forced to leave as soon as they got married. But yes, I think it probably always has been a bit ahead. Um, just wondering whether Jack might like to um, say something. Um, Jack, are you sure? No, you won't get in trouble. Jack, would you? Uh, you're, you're the only man in this room, and you've been listening very politely to all these women talking too much. Do you have? Do you have just sort of one observation or takeaway from what's happened? Can I pass you the microphone? Um, I suppose I, I used to work in uh, theatres, like. Um, like uh, operational theatres. Uh, I was just like a porter, just was a kind of job just to get me by after university. And one of the things that I found very encouraging was that it's almost a bit of like a matriarchy there because the, you'll have these surgeons who, you know, want, you know, hundreds of grand a year, um, semi-retired as well of the NHS. And they will literally listen to them down to the T. As soon as the head sister talks, it's everyone shuts up, listens. So I think it's, it's in particular environments you can see that in work. And I don't know if that comes down to like, just obviously the theater, what the sort of situation is in, or if it's just the women have learned to become more confident or authoritative, but I suppose it's just an interesting take really. So it wasn't really a question, but. It's a good observation, thank you very much. Um, and all the women's observations were excellent, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, Tristina Godoy Contois asked, what are some strategies you would recommend to improve the perception of competence amongst a more male audience? Or is there no hope? Smiley face. <laughs> <laughs> Again, it is a question of overlaying it with warmth. This is what all the research suggests, is that men are much... Um, more likely to listen to a woman and to rate her as competent and likable if she ladles on loads of warmth on top. So, I mean, it's, it's fine if you're that sort of person, it's great. It, it's a shame if you've got to be an authentic, but hey, if that's the way we've got to get on in the world, uh, I'm afraid that's what we've got to do. I don't mind too much actually, because, you know, I quite like sort of getting on with people and um, smiling and having fun. But I know I, I talked to Hella Torning Schmidt, who was Prime Minister of Denmark, and um, she said that she found it a real problem as a Prime Minister because people always said, "We just don't know you enough, and we, you know, we want to know, yeah, you know, we want you to be warmer. We want to sort of, I don't know, we want to know more about your. We want you to sort of think with your heart as well as your head," is how she put it. And she said, "This is a real problem because as a Prime Minister, you actually need to take decisions with your head, not your heart." And then she said they never said that about previous male prime ministers, but because she was a woman, somehow she had to score on both charts. Okay, I think we have one last question. I'm afraid I don't have a name for the uh, person who's asked this, but it's a good question. Um, have you observed other women also carrying forward an authority bias against other women as well? Um, she says, I've observed that women I've worked with tend to expect other women to go with the group consensus or, or are worse off. And senses um, suggests she's been attacked by other female managers from, from speaking from more of a logos driven perspective rather than an ethos argument <laughs> oh. 
very good. Uh, yes, uh, we, I'm afraid, are probably not quite as, as biased uh, uh, as men, but we do have a lot of unconscious bias because of what we've grown up with and what we've seen around us. And there is the added factor of, I think this is probably more true in the generation above me of what was called the Queen Bee Syndrome. Um, you know, Margaret Thatcher typically promoted only one woman into her cabinet in her 13 years in power, and she only lasted about six months. Um, they were in some senses behaving rationally because often there was only room for one woman at the top. The men were pre prepared to have one woman, but no more than one. And therefore other women were genuinely competition and threat. And the other thing was that in those days when it was very rare to be a woman in the top, at the top or, or in a senior position, you sort of had to, you had to sign up to the men's values in order to be accepted because otherwise they saw you as sort of an interloper, a fifth columnist almost. And so quite a lot of women felt they had to be more masculine than the men in order to be accepted. And this was certainly true of Thatcher. Um, but yeah, I'm afraid uh, in, in um, study, in um, studies of unconscious bias, uh, Harvard has a thing called the implicit association test. And women actually score slightly higher than men on unconscious bias when it comes to, you have to see how quickly and accurately you can pair female words with either work or, sorry, female or male words with work or family words. And men are actually slightly better at it, more accurate than women. So uh, women, it's our fault again, and we've got to work a little bit harder to get over um, this. Um, I'm just gonna run with, this is the book. It's out next week, Thursday. next Thursday, thank you. Um, but you can purchase it um, here. And Ellie, can people bu um, buy it? Is, is it on the bookshop? Uh, it will be after online. It'll be on the bookshop. It'll be on the bookshop as well for all the online audience. For those watching at home, you can order it too. Um, thank you very much to our trouble member, Marianne Seagart, who's got many other strings to her bow as well. And best of luck with the book. And um, could you let Ellie know um, whether you've managed to get this into the hands of men and what was the strategy for it when it happens? <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you all. And thank you to Marianne. Thank you.